Welcome everyone. Today we're going to be talking about O-ring theory. Turns out O-ring theory has implications for development, but it also has implications for the industrial organization of developed economies. That is, for how firms and workers are organized when maximizing the value of production requires that we work as a team. O-ring theory is also going to have implications for our understanding of inequality. Let's take a look. The O-ring theory of development is primarily due to a very creative economist called Michael Kramer. Now we're going to call O-ring production or an O-ring production function if the production task has the following attributes. It's going to depend upon completing a series of tasks. Moreover, failure at any one of these tasks is going to reduce the value of the entire product, perhaps to zero. So this is the weakest link problem. One weak link in a chain destroys the entire value of the chain. It's also going to be the case with an O-ring production function that we can't substitute quantity for quality. I'll come back to that in a minute. Let me give you some examples. Take microchips. A single speck of dust on a microchip run ruins all of those microchips. Or think about a souffle. To make a souffle, you've got to get the ingredients right, You've got to get the temperature right. You've got to take the souffle out of the oven at just the right time. Mess up on any one of these tasks, and the souffle will collapse. Or what about a musical? To make a great musical, you're going to require an excellent lyricist, a wonderful composer, a great director, superb performers. You need an entire team, and the talents of that team must all come together at the right time, at the right place. Notice what we mean here by you can't substitute quantity for quality. Two mediocre chefs are not going to be better at making a wonderful souffle than uh, one great chef. For a musical, if you don't have Stephen Sondheim, then you can't replace him by saying, well, we'll add you know, three or four or five or more mediocre composers to make up for the fact that we don't have one great composer. It doesn't work that way. Now, why do they, we call this O-ring production? Well, as you probably know, this is due to the destruction, the explosion of the Challenger space uh, shuttle. As famously shown by the physicist Richard Feynman, the major cause of that explosion was the failure of a very simple product, a failure of the O-ring to expand because it was too cold. So this cheap, really inconsequential product, it was only worth you know, $10 or something like that because it didn't expand at the right time, because this one piece of the puzzle didn't work right, the entire spacecraft, along with seven people, was lost. So that's O-ring production. Let's formalize this model a little bit. We'll assume that there are n tasks, one worker per task. It doesn't have to be that way, but that simplifies things. And we're going to let QI be the quality level of worker I or task I. So QI equal to 0.9, this can be interpreted in different ways, but an easy interpretation is to think that 0.9 means there's a 90% chance of completing the task perfectly and a 10% chance of complete failure. It could also mean there's a 50% chance of completing the task perfectly and a 50% chance of reducing the value by 20%. That is, 1 half times 1 plus 1 half times 0.8, reducing the value of the entire product by 20%, equals 0.9. So there are different ways of interpreting these quality levels. Output is going to equal the number of tasks times the quality level in each task, all multiplied together. So this is really the key to the model, to multiply these quality levels in each task all together. So for example, if there are 10 tasks and the quality level of every worker is 0.99, then output will be equal to 10 times 0.99 to the power of 10, or 9.04. So notice that if each worker were perfect at a quality level of 1, then the output would be 10. Because each worker has a 1% chance of messing up, the output or the expected output is 9. If the quality level of the workers went down to 0.95, notice that the output would fall to 6. So just a small decrease in the quality level decreases the output by a lot. If the quality level went down to 0.9, again, not that big a drop, the
the output level goes down to 3.5, an awfully big drop in output for a relatively small drop in the quality level. One of the most important implications of the O-Rig model is that we'll have quality matching. That is, that output will be higher if we put all the high quality workers together and all the low quality workers together compared with if we mix the workers up. Let's do a simple example. Suppose we have two high quality workers and two low quality workers. If we put the high quality workers together in one firm, then the output we get is 2, the number of tasks, times QH times QH, or 2QH squared. The low quality workers then are 2QL squared for the same reasons. If we mix, we then have again two firms. In one firm we get 2, the number of tasks, times QH times QL, and the same thing for the second firm. Okay, which one of these is bigger? Well, we can get rid of the 2's. That gives us QH squared plus QL squared compared with getting rid of the 2's here, the 2 here. We still have 2QHQL. Which one of those is bigger? Let's just uh, put in some numbers. So suppose that QH is 1 and QL is 1 half. Therefore, for the match group, we get 1 squared plus 1 half squared. And for the mix group, we get 2 times 1 times 1 half. Let's see. Well, that's a quarter, one and a quarter for the match group and just one for the mixed group. Therefore, you want to match. What about other examples? Okay, let's do a general proof. If QH is bigger than QL, then notice that QH minus QL squared is certainly bigger than zero. Well, just using FOIL, multiplying these out, we get QH squared plus QL squared minus 2QHQL. Let's put the 2QHQL on the other side we get QH squared plus QL squared is bigger than 2QHQL. But notice that this is just exactly our statement here for comparing the match output with the mix output. So this tells us that for any QH and any QL, the match output is bigger than the mix output. Now, it's not too hard to show that in a competitive economy with quality matching, Higher output is going to mean higher wages. So remember now that the effect of quality on output, which we now know is going to be the same as the effect of quality on wages, this is highly nonlinear. So if all the out workers have a quality level of 1, then output is going to be 10 up here. Notice that if quality falls just a little bit to 0.9, output falls a huge amount to less than 4. So you get a big drop in quality, big drop in output with a fairly small drop in quality. Indeed, notice that if quality falls in half, output is basically going to zero. You know, you can't even see on this graph how small output is with a drop in quality of a half. So what this says is that if there are differences in quality levels across countries, then one country may have much, much smaller GDP per capita than the other country, even though the quality levels are not that different. A fairly small decrease in, in the quality levels of the workers creates a big decrease in wages. We can also see this at a national level in a slightly different way. Suppose the talent distribution is something like this on the left-hand side. That is, most of the workers have a talent level of uh, one. Uh, this is sort of an arbitrary number here. I don't think of it as all being perfect. Just think of it as an arbitrary scale. But suppose most of the workers have this talent distribution somewhere around here. Okay. When you map that into the wage distribution, taking into account the fact that we have O-ring production, what you get is wages. You get a big right-hand tail. You get wages are much more unequal than talent. So a fairly equal distribution of talent, when you map that into the O-ring model, turns into a unequal distribution of wages. So in particular, notice that over here, there's hardly anybody who has a talent level of two or greater. Very, very few people in this economy have a talent level of two or greater. And yet, wages, a large fraction of the wages are going to go to people who have a talent level of two or more. So this shows you how an O-ring model magnifies 
the distribution of talent, turning it into a much more unequal distribution of wages. Here's another implication of the model. In an O-ring model, workers performing the same task will earn higher wages in a high-skill firm than in a low-skill firm. So, for example, the highest quality secretaries will work with the highest quality CEOs, simply because a mistake by one of those secretaries is going to be so much more damaging when she works for a high quality CEO than for a low quality CEO. Apple. They'll hire the best programmers and the best designers. They'll also want to hire the best janitors, and they'll pay them the most, at least to the extent that the output of those janitors contributes to the output of the entire product. The same idea applies to the economy as a whole. High-quality workers will be paid more when there are more high-quality workers to work with. Talent likes to work with other talent. There's a multiplier effect here. The more high-talented, high-quality workers you're surrounded with, the more your earnings are going to be. It's one reason I like to work with Tyler. It's not just, we have to take a longer picture view of this as well, is when there's a lot of high-quality workers around, it pays you to invest in being a high-quality worker. Similarly, if there's just a lot of low-skill workers around, it doesn't pay you to be a high-quality worker. So if we think about a very smart person in a poor country surrounded by low-quality workers, that person isn't going to earn a lot. They, in fact, may not want to invest in an education or in building up their skills because the skills won't pay very much when they don't have those people to work on their team when they can't combine with other high-quality people, when they can't get that high payoff, which comes with multiplying high-quality by high-quality. This indicates that in these models, there's a potential for multiple equilibria. You can have a high-quality uh, equilibrium where everyone wants to be high-skilled, but you could also have for exactly the same people. For exactly the same people, you might also end up in a low-quality equilibria where no one is getting high-skilled and no one thinks it's worthwhile to become a high-skill worker. In an O-ring model, capital wants to work with high-quality workers for exactly the same reasons that high-quality workers want to work with each other. In particular, note that more capital in these models doesn't substitute for lower-skilled workers. So if you give me a Stradivarius, I'm not going to be a better violin player. You don't want to do something like this, therefore. You don't want to have Homer Simpson running the nuclear power plant. This is a failure of quality matching. Don't do that. Instead, what you want to do is you want to match the best workers with the most expensive machines. So you want Itzhak Perlman with the Stradivarius. Implication of this is that poor countries will have more workers in less capital-intensive primary production. So, for example, agriculture. This force magnifies all the other forces we were talking about earlier. So in particular, capital is going to flow away from countries which have low-skill workers, going to want to go to countries which have high-skill workers. This means that you're going to have lower income and wages in countries with low-skill workers. This magnifies all the effects we were talking about earlier. Similarly, poor countries will have more workers in production tasks or production jobs that are simpler that require fewer tasks. Let's take a closer look at this. So what we're showing here is three jobs scaled so that you get 100% of output when the workers are of perfectly high quality. Job one requires the workers to get five tasks right, job two that they get 10 tasks, and job three that they get 40 tasks right. Now here's the point. If you take workers of reasonably high skill level, 0.9, but you assign them to a job which requires that they get 40 things right. We're getting one thing wrong, one of those tasks wrong can reduce the value of the entire product, then your chances of getting full output are virtually nil. On the other hand, if you take those same workers and you assign them to a job which requires that they get just five things right, then your chances of getting full output are much higher. So think about this as being bicycle production, car production, and space shuttle production. What this says is that countries with lower skilled workforces, they're going to specialize in things like bicycle production, which tend to be lower paid. Uh, the value of the entire product tends to be lower when the number of tasks required is lower. What this also says is that 
If you have a job requiring a lot of tasks, like a space shuttle, where you've got to get even hundreds of tasks right in order to get the full value of the product, then you really want to be working with workers of the very highest skill level to have any chance of producing that high quality product. We can apply many of these ideas at the level of the economy as a whole, in which case it becomes a theory of bottlenecks, linkages, and complementarities. So let's think about N industries, each performing a single task. And following Kramer, let's suppose the quality falls by half in just two of these tasks or industries. So if, for example, the electricity production becomes more spotty and subject to blackouts. Corruption increases at the License Bureau, requiring us to spend a lot more to get a license. Well, even though quality has fallen in just two of the many tasks which we need to complete, output is going to fall immediately by 75%. Moreover, there are going to be knock-on effects. Wages in every other sector of the economy are also going to fall because the total value of the product has fallen. And this fall in wages is going to greatly reduce the incentive to invest in quality in all those other sectors. And that reduces output further in the long run. So you can have a bottleneck, and a bottleneck affects not just that sector of the economy, but every other sector of the economy. Because you have complementarities, when one sector goes down, the other sectors also go down as well. This shows, by the way, the importance of trade as a w method of avoiding those bottlenecks, of rooting around bottlenecks. If you can import a fairly high-quality good, perform just a few tasks in country, and then export that good, then you can root around the bottleneck and get some development even when not every sector in your economy is working well. If instead you've got to produce everything in-house, everything in-country, then you need every sector in that economy to be working well when you're working with O-ring production because you have all of these complementarities across industries. Okay, let's give some final thoughts about O-ring production. First, not every industry is an O-ring industry. But perhaps in our modern world, more industries are moving in this direction. That tells us something about the sources of growing inequality. O-ring production also reminds us that production is complex. The production often requires that every member of a team be working in the same direction, like a sports team. Every member has got to be performing at their highest level of ability in order to get those wins. This tells us that organizational capital, the ability to bring together high-skilled workers with uh, expensive capital and to get all those workers and that capital working together in a team at the highest level of skill, the, the ability to do that is incredibly important. And the more complex production grows, the more tasks that are required to achieve maximum production, the more valuable organizational capital, the ability to bring these workers and capital together, the more valuable those skills are going to become. In an O-ring model, you can get virtuous and vicious cycles. When one industry in an O-ring model increases its ability, that increases the incentive of every other industry to perform at its highest level of ability. But the same thing is also true in reverse. When one team member or when one industry is performing at a low level, that reduces the incentive of all the other industries to perform at a high level. Hence, you can get growth miracles and growth disasters. Now, what does it take to coordinate a team, to coordinate an economy on that high-skill equilibrium where everyone is working at their maximum level? Well, this is an incredibly hard problem. This is all about what culture is about. It's an incredibly hard problem but also an incredibly important problem and something important to think about. Thanks very much.